My name's Richard Martin. I grew up on a farm, and of course then as uh, I got older, you know, and, and uh, we moved off the farm, my mom and dad parted, and so my mom struggled with five kids and uh, transferred uh, from out of Hiawatha and Kirkland to uh, Rockford schools. I went to Auburn, that was my senior year, and that was in 63. I was supposed to graduate that year and I'd been taking up a lot of courses to make up for credits. And two weeks before graduation, our gowns come in and we were trying our gowns on and somebody come down and said, hey Martin, the counselor wants to see you upstairs. So I went upstairs and uh, he said, uh, I just realized that you're a half a credit behind and you won't be able to graduate. He said, but you can do it in summer school. And I, as huffy as I got, I walked out and never went back. Well, I listened because I didn't know where to go. Uh, when I got all hot-headed at school, when I found out I wasn't gonna graduate, you know, and I, I probably could have just relaxed and thought about it and, and went back and made that half credit up. That just blew my mind. And uh, so I, I, you know, that was a, a thing that, there was nothing at home. My mom was, you know, was home with the other kids. And uh, so I just went up and told her, she said, now what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I'm done with school. So I said, I'm going into service. You know, of course, of course that was, uh, uh, she, she cried, you know, and stuff. Vietnam was cranking up. And I figured, well, if I go into the Navy, my chances of being on land over there you know, and it was early Vietnam. It hadn't even cranked up yet because it, that didn't crank up until Tet Offensive in the latter part of 67 and 68. I was just uh, just like anybody else. It was, you're kind of scared because you don't know what to expect. And uh, boot camp wasn't too rough on me uh, because when they found out I played drums, they stuck me in the drum and bugle corps. So while all my buddies were out pounding the tarmac and pushing the weapon, I was climbing on a bus in my dress uniform to go play in parades around the Chicago area. And uh, so I spent my whole time in boot camp. The only uh, uh, fallback to that was that when my company's time was up in boot camp and they were moving on, they didn't have a drummer come in to replace me, so they put me in a holding company and I wound up two weeks later than they th getting out of boot camp. But then I was, uh, they sent me home for 14 days and then off to submarine school in Groton, Connecticut. I had it so easy in boot camp, but I always knew, and I, I never was a good swimmer, but I, I just barely passed the swimming test to get in. And, uh, but I did. I wasn't afraid of water. I just couldn't swim real good. You know, I did, that just wasn't one of my things. And uh, I passed the test, that, and then because of that, I got a real awakening when I got into submarine school because uh, one of our classes was going through the tower. And uh, the tower was 134 feet deep. And the first what they did was it took you up to the top of the tower and uh, on the outside they had an elevator that took you up to the top of the tower. And when you went in there, here's this huge area, circular area around an open tower that's full of water. And when you, they walk you up there and you can look down in it, and there's divers, scuba gear on. They tell you what uh, is going to happen. You're going to go down 50 feet in an escape, and they're going to put you in an escape chamber. And they'll take six of you at a time. And once the, uh, the instructor inside that tank instructs you, uh, you'll be going into the tank and making your way up with a breath of air. And we all look at each other and say, Oh boy, well, they took us out there. We got in, they went down, and six of us went in, and I'll never forget, all of a sudden, the first thing that happened, the water starting to come up around your feet. You're in this little tiny, just barely enough room for six guys. It's got all these pipes and stuff in it, you know, and, and the instructor, he's, uh, you got this life jacket on you, comes, slips over your head, and s snaps into the front, and, uh, as soon as the water gets up to here, he reaches over and he hits that air, those that life jacket with air. And the life jacket fills up with air and you're like trying to hold yourself down in that little tank with him. And next thing you know, he's telling you, take a breath of air. So you go, you think you got enough air? Take another breath. You think you got enough? 
take another one. As soon as you get both feet straight, you slap your thing, look up, and you're supposed to blow bubbles out real slow. So you got one breath of air, you're going through that water with that life jacket on. It's hauling up toward the surface like a football if you held a football underwater or a basketball. You've got that on and you're going up through there. What you don't realize is that you're not gonna run out of air because the air in your lungs is expanding as you go up. And you can't hold your breath. If the diver sees you stop blowing bubbles out, there's a cord that was hanging between your legs with a handle on it. And they would take and drag you off into an escape chamber. And there's no way out of the escape chamber, all that has is air in it. And that happened to me. I was like 10 feet from the surface. And next thing I know, I'm yanked into an escape thing. And the diver says, how do you feel? And I said, well, I got a little bit of a headache. And I said, how do, how do we get out of here? And he said, well, you gotta go back in the tank. I said, oh boy. Well, he said, we'll just sit here for a minute, let's talk. And he talked to me and, and he said, okay, how do you feel? And I said, oh, I'm okay, I guess. So back down, take a breath of air, go back down and come up. When I got up there, they had a doctor waiting for me. And the doctor says, uh, how do you feel, Mr. Martin? And I said, well, I've got a headache. And he said, well, just stand here for a few minutes. Well, about 15 minutes later, he come back, said, how do you feel? And I said, fine. He said, good, let's go down and do it again. So I had to go down the 100 foot level this time. And trust me, I made it up. I blew very little air out because, uh, you know, as long as I saw the bubbles coming out, I was blowing. If you blow too fast, you're not out of air, but mentally you think you're out of air because you're, you're, it's not something you're used to. So you never run out of air going up. And that, that training was uh, devised for the older submarines if we were to set on the, on the bottom of a lake or a, or a shallow, you know, 400 feet, 300 feet. The idea was that the submarine could go up through our escape chamber in the forward torpedo room and safely make it to the surface on a breath of air. And from there, when I graduated from submarine school in Groton, Connecticut, they sent me home because that was gonna be the last time I saw home for a year. So I come home for another 14 days and went uh, down to Charleston, South Carolina. And when I got on the base, uh, they got down to the pier. The guy came walking down and he said, are you Martin? And I said, uh, yep. He said, well, follow me. And of course the submarine was tied up at the end of the pier. And I never forget. I said, what's that smell? And he said, that's that submarine you're going to. Because <laughs> those old submarines really really were bad with the diesel and then guys cooped up in them for months at a time you know we go out and and it's all sweaty and stuff but showers weren't uh, there weren't that many showers uh, it, it was uh, far and few in between and, and a lot of times in the engine room I, I was pretty much the guy that raised his hand to do stuff that nobody else would do and uh, I'll never forget we cracked uh, one of our 300 pound cylinder liners for one of them big diesel engines Underneath the, uh, in the engine room, the lower level are two high pressure air compressors and beneath that is the tank. And to the back side is a, is a cover with, I don't know, 20, 30 bolts in it, flanged there, that you could go into. And what they did was they asked for a volunteer to go into that lube oil tank and we had to go in bare, bare naked. So I went into my skivvies, nobody else would do it because that is exposed to the outside hull there and so it's really cold <laughs> and they needed someone so I got down in that lube oil tank in my skivvies and I crawled back into the tank and of course the submarine is doing this and they had it the cylinder liner in brackets and I had to take it out of brackets and hold it back to keep it from crushing me because it, it would slide once because it, it was in lube oil. And the lube oil tank could only be drained down this far, so I was in my belly up to lube oil, crawling back in there. And uh, then when I got, it, got the thing loose, got it pushed back through the baffles, got it to the opening, they had a pile of rags and them guys up, would be up on top, they hooked a chain fall to it and they are lifting it up and they're wiping it down as they're lifting it up and throwing the rags aside. And I had to sit there in that lube oil until I got it done. And of course, then I got out and they had towels for me to clean, to wipe off. And I was the only one that week that got, 
got to take a shower. We had to come up to periscope depth to take on air, and the, your newer ones, they make oxygen out of the water. The only thing we made out of the water is I had two distilling units in the Ford engine room that made a thousand gallons a day a piece. So we'd take on 2,000 gallons until we needed it again for drinking and showering. And they put a snorkel on. Before they put the snorkel on, we'd have to surface and man the guns and while we were charging our batteries. And uh, once they put the snorkel on, why, they got rid of the guns because we didn't have to surface. The only purpose of those guns was to protect us because we were uh, in harm's way the minute we surfaced. Uh, the, once we got the snorkels on, well, the snorkels, we could come up to 50 foot and raise our snorkel mast up. And as soon as that snorkel mast cleared the water, I would get a green light back in the Christmas tree in our, what, what we call them Christmas trees, in the engine room to fire off an engine. And uh, I'd fire off either one or two engines, whatever they called for. And uh, we would steam along underwater. The, the thing about snorkeling was that the roughest thing about snorkeling was that when water splashed over that snorkel head, it had many sensors around it that would slam it shut so that we wouldn't take water into our engines. So the minute that slammed shut, if it was a big wave, the engines were drawing their air from inside that closed submarine. So the vacuum in there was enough to pop your eardrums. It was enough to pop guys that were hiding bottles of wine in their satchel bags it would pop the corks out of them. And then we'd have the smell, because it was a closed system, a smell of alcohol <laughs> on the submarine. And of course, the first thing you heard was the old man up there and saying, all right, who's got the alcohol, you know? <laughs> so there was no hiding it when that happened. Interesting duty. Uh, I don't know if you, a lot of people probably think that when submarines go out to sea, that uh, during a hurricane, that, uh, they would submerge where it's nice and peaceful. Wrong. The old subs like I was on, I found out during the hurricane, we pulled out of Charleston, South Carolina before the hurricane got to us. And I thought, boy, oh boy, I told the chief, get out there and dive. I said, well, we won't have to worry about it. And he said, oh, they blow all air and you ride it down the surface like a bobber. If you submerge, depending on the size of the swell, could put you below your crush depth. So they didn't take a chance of uh, diving because they didn't know, you know, under the circumstances, they weren't, they were afraid because some of the swells were, I, I would go up in the conning tower at times and ask permission to look through the periscope when they were up close enough to stick the periscope up. And the swells, you'd go so far down in those swells that all you saw was water all the way around you. You could turn that thing around and all you saw was water because you couldn't even see the top of the, the swell, the, the waves. That's how bad the swells were out there. You know, that's a big ocean out there. It'll swallow, swallow you up in a hurry if you're not careful, but riding a hurricane on the surface, that was, that was a real experience. And I, I, you never seen so many sick sailors, even the ones that had been in there for 25 years. They were all sick, it was just a mess. I mean, they sit out there and you could see the, the front of the sub would go up and then it would roll to the right and the back end would come up and push you forward and then it would go down and it would twist this way. And I can remember it rolling so far that I finally tied a, a nut on a string from the ceiling and I'd watch that string go all the way over. And of course, we had to take that down because guys were watching it and getting sick. But we'd roll so far that I would actually, it would stand me up and I could walk straight across the side of the engine that was supposed to be vertical. So that it was, yeah, seen some pretty rough seas. I didn't, we were riding on a, uh, on a submarine out and bobbing around during a hurricane with 100 foot swells. That was probably one of the worst uh, times of my submarine career because uh, if you'd ever been seasick, it was a feeling that you weren't getting over with during that hurricane and that thing seemed to last for hours and hours and hours. Uh, they had me up, uh, one time on the superstructure, which is on top. The superstructure, you don't have a superstructure on the nukes because they don't have diesel engines that need air, you know. And if they do have any on them, I would imagine the air they're taking is from the air they're making. And I don't know if they can produce it fast enough to run an engine with closed doors, but 
they're, they're not big engines anyhow like we had on ours. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, yeah, they did uh, need somebody to go down in that superstructure to tighten up some bolts on the flanges for uh, exhaust that the engines use. And they couldn't get anybody that would get down there because it was a tight space. And uh, I popped down in there and they passed me a wrench down and I got them all tightened up real good for them. And then I couldn't get out because while I was down there, I didn't know if I was thinking about it, but you know how a kid can push his head through a couple of rails and they can't get out? <laughs> well, I squeezed my body down there and couldn't get out. And they had to call a corpsman because I was panicking and we were supposed to be pulling out to sea and I didn't want to be down in that superstructure when we went out to sea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he finally came out and he handed me a bunch of Vaseline down. He said, they reached down and they tried to rub it on my shoulders, my back and everything, you know, and I was rubbing it all over. And then they said, uh, just let's sit here and talk for a minute. And uh, the, the corpsman sat there and he talked to me about stuff that was irrelevant to what I was doing. And pretty soon he just said, come on out. And I pushed up and popped out. But yeah, stuff like that, just stuff that I wouldn't think of doing now. <laughs> you know, young and stupid, you know, we all thought we were invincible. Yeah, crazy stuff. The whole time I was on that sub, uh, we did a lot of, uh, of North Atlantic. And uh, the, uh, you've heard of the, uh, the Barrier Patrol Reef, one of the deepest parts of the ocean, like six, seven miles deep in some spots. We did a lot of burial patrol, uh, barrier runs. And, uh, and uh, of course, on our sub, the new subs, they go very deep. The old sub like I was on, our crushed up was 450 feet. And uh, many times our old man, we'd hear on the radio, uh, rig, rig doubler hatches were going to and take her deep, you know, 500 feet. And we'd all look at each other thinking, oh my gosh, our crushed up's 450. But in the, every time that we did that, we'd get down there deep and we'd sit there because you got nothing running but the batteries. And sometimes we just sat at a negative buoyancy, you know, and so we didn't go up or down. And you could hear, it sounded like a, when you crush a can, you could hear that going on and you all sit and look at each other and, and you could hear things popping. And, and we never had anything. We did blow a sea strainer one time and uh, we weren't that rigged it deep though. We were only down about 250 feet and a sea strainer blew. And I was in the after engine room helping them rig a doubler hatch so we could go deep. And a doubler hatch is a, big steel plate basically with about 50 some holes in it that snaps up below the onto the uh, bottom of the uh, after engine room hatch that you can go out that it goes up there and you have about six guys holding this thing up it weighs about 350 pounds and then they got a, a guy with a bolt on each side that runs a one inch bolt up through there and puts a nut on it and gets it tight and then they, then they have to start. Well, we had just got that doubler hatch up and the guy was getting ready to put a bolt in it when the sea strainer blew. And what happens is there was water shooting up from underneath the lower level of the engine room. And you can imagine being down 250 feet and having a hole blow open in the, that was open to the sea, what that sounded like. And everybody jumped and ran and we backed off and dropped that 300 pound plate and of course, we were all young and foolish, you know, and all the guys jumped out and they dogged me into the engine room. So here I'm in an engine room, they wouldn't open the hatch. And I'm looking through the little tiny sight glass on the, on the door that's about that thick, saying, come on guys, let me out of here, you know, and, and uh, the, the noise was crazy and I finally realized, you know what? I went into the back of the engine room, went down into the lower level because I realized there's, for every valve that goes through the hull on, a, on one of the old submarines, there's a backup valve. So I went down and shut the backup valve off. Of course, we had a big laugh over that. I wasn't real happy about it, but the other guys had a big laugh about it. <laughs> and I think it was, uh, well, in 64, I did a med cruise and uh, we were over in the Mediterranean and uh, we pulled into Naples, Italy and I had Liberty. So me and a chief were gonna hit the beach there in Naples, Italy, and we did. We went over and we weren't on the, walking down the street more than an hour in Naples when we got rounded up by shore patrol and rushed back to our sub. And uh, 
that's when I climbed down a forward torpedo room and the torpedo man had one of our torpedoes. He had the cover off it. And I said, what's going on? And he said, this is a real thing, kid. He said, I'm arming all the igniters on our torpedoes. There's been an outbreak between Cyprus and Greece and we've been called to patrol the area. So that was the only uh, actual action I ever seen. And we patrolled that island for weeks, you know, out there we'd surface to see if we had any, what we called targets, you know, most surface ships we all call targets. That's why if I get a buddy that says, yeah, I was on a carrier, I'll say, oh, a target. <laughs> I can remember a time when we were, when we were out and I was off watch. And when you're off watch, if you're qualified, you don't have to go around qualifying. If you're not qualified on a submarine, you stand your four or eight hour watch, whatever it is, and when you're off, you have to be qualifying. You have to know that submarine. So you go into each compartment, forward torpedo room, after battery, uh, control room, and you learn everything about that submarine. So uh, I can remember uh, being in the, after getting off watch one night and uh, went to the after torpedo room. I, I didn't bunk back there, I bunked in the after battery. But I was with a buddy and we were back there just crashed on the flash blankets there. The lower torpedoes, we didn't have any in those slots. So those bunks, there's bunks that go over those torpedo holders. And we were just kind of laying there like this. And all of a sudden, with our heads toward the, the forward part of the compartment, torpedo tubes aft, and all of a sudden, our feet go up in the air and our heads are going down deep and I, I thought what's going on here all of a sudden we're looking at each other you know because all of a sudden something happened we're, we're at a drastic dive angle and we're already down about 250 feet. Next thing I hear was the emergency surface alarm go off ooga 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 and then it took a it went the other way and it was, went so steep that him and I both slid off those things all the way down and we couldn't stop or help ourselves, slid all the way down between the torpedo tubes. You know, and then of course it started leveling off, we got up and come to find out, uh, they have people that are qualifying and usually they don't get qualified because we call them valve twisters. They're, these are the type of people that when they're going through qualifying have to turn something or pull something to find out what it does and somebody pulled the lever and shut the hydraulics off to our bow, forward bow planes, and the bow planes drifted to full dive. So here we are on our way down, and, and it only took a matter of seconds for them to, to find what the problem was. You know, sometimes submarine can be lost like that, just because of that. I mean, uh, if somebody forgets to shut a, an engineer induction valve, that, that would flood the sub so fast that nobody would have a chance to, to do anything about it. We didn't have any radio communications underwater, you know. So usually the radio communications came when we either snorkeled or surfaced. And we were about 600 miles out at sea when John Kennedy got shot. And I never forget, uh, we had come up to uh, snorkel depth uh, to raise the snorkel so I could fire off an engine. And of course then our antennas are exposed also when that goes up. And we got word that he had killed, but then they all shut off all operations. We surfaced and we had a day of mourning. We just stayed on the surface. Uh, we actually, uh, the guys uh, that didn't want to, uh, we got, actually went out and they lowered the bow planes on the surface and we, I, I went up in the tower with the M1 and stood uh, shark duty and uh, watched for sharks while the guys went swimming, you know, because we didn't get, that was one of the ways they could uh, blow off some steam. So a nice day we go out there. and It's kind of interesting when you get out there and you dive into the ocean and you go dive under and you can see the entire length of the submarine and you can't see the bottom of, of the ocean anywhere, you know. It's really a, a scary feeling. It's how big that ocean is. I was in for three years because uh, I signed up for a three-year stint and I wound up getting uh, a one month uh, involuntary extension for Vietnam. I didn't go, but they wouldn't let me out at the time I was supposed to go. We pulled in to NAD, Navy Ammunition Depot, to load torpedoes. I was supposed to be getting out, me and another guy. We made it to the end of the pier before they brought us back and we had to unpack and go back out to sea for a month. But uh, as far as my time during that time, 
I spent uh, three years and one month in there, and I spent two years and nine months at sea. And at sea, I meant away from the States. We pulled into other ports. But I spent a lot of time at sea on that submarine. And I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it until after I left it. With toil and tears, we have had to earn our heritage again. If we fail now, then we will have forgotten in abundance what we learned in hardship. That democracy rests on faith. That freedom asks more than it gives. And the judgment of God is harshest on those who are most favored. Upon arrival home, many veterans of the Vietnam War encountered resentment from their fellow Americans. Typically, those in service came home to a welcoming scene full of parades and celebration. However, Vietnam veterans experienced a new reality hatred. The war soon became unpopular as a result of secrets and lies told by the government, more specifically Lyndon B. Johnson. This negativity was then taken out on veterans who were labeled as baby killers and warmongers, making the vets feel isolated and unappreciated. This was further extended into Hollywood and music by several writers. One example of this is in the Battle Hymn of Lieutenant Callie, a song that portrays a young boy who wants to be in service one day. It then goes over his experience in battle as a soldier and concludes with his rebuttal of negative views on such veterans, saying he was just following orders he received. He also acknowledges the lack of recognition for serving his country by U.S. residents. It wasn't until the 1980s that these veterans got the appreciation they fought for, but the pain felt is still very distressing. I was pretty proud of my uniform, but when I got out, they told me, don't wear your uniform home. So here I am going through the airports carrying a sea bag in civilian clothes. Didn't wear my uniform, come home, there was nobody waiting when I got home. So, they, of course, they didn't know I was coming because uh, when I was supposed to come home, they extended me and I went back out to sea. So when I finally got out, I just got on a plane and flew home and, uh, but yeah, they have somebody tell me not to wear my uniform because, you know, it might offend somebody, I guess. My brother-in-law was in the Navy too and, of course, they, they, had, they had put down signs where he was at, dogs and sailors stay off our grass. I actually actually uh, had a Vietnam era Jeep that I drove in all the parades. I got pictures of it, tons of pictures of me in the parades with Vietnam with that Jeep. It's got an M60 mounted on it. I don't have any, I got rid of it. I had a gal yell at me right out here in 251 one day and yelled, baby killer. And I, you know, I'm riding out here, it is how many years since this has gone on and there's still people out there that have that on their mind. Yeah, years later you stop and think about these things and boy, you wonder well, how you ever did it. It's a very interesting duty for a young guy, you know. You, you, know, you, you know, when you're young, 18, 19 years old, I was 18 when I went, man, you know, you think you can conquer the world, <laughs> you know. And of course, there's always a, I didn't drink or smoke when I went in and when I come out, I drank and smoked. You know, I almost became a drunk. I had, and that's something that uh, I had to whip right away. Luckily, I've been married to a woman for over 40 some years now, and uh, neither one of us drink or smoke. So it's, it's, it's been a, a good life as far as that goes. However, they, they haven't uh, contributed anything uh, to my service time other than my hearing uh, as being affected, but my liver is almost gone. I belong to the USSVI, which is the United States Submarine Veterans Incorporated. We meet once a month up in South Beloit, and uh, every meeting we have someone who's elected to ring the bell, and then we read off 
for that month, every submarine that we've ever had, and they, uh, they'll read off how many crew members went with it. And very few times, very few submarines have any of the crew members survive. When they go down, all the, mem all the crew goes down. I, I, uh, I never considered myself a Vietnam vet until the VVA, the Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, wanted me to join, and I said, well, I don't feel I'm a, a veteran, you know. And they said, oh, no, send your papers in. So I sent my DD-214, copy of my DD-214 into Washington, and court come back, and so I'm, I'm a life member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. It's like a guy told me, you know, any time you're on a warship during a, a, a conflict or a war, you're part of that war, whether you're in the Atlantic or Pacific. And then Vietnam, I sat on the board at Vietnam, I've been with them for, oh, 18 years, and uh, I also belong to the Navy Club. I also, I'm on the uh, Veterans Assistance Commission. I'm also on the Veterans Association at Memorial Hall. And I've been on, I, I've been up to the uh, Cobia up in there I, for Subfest up in Manitowoc. If you've ever, never been there, go there. They shut the streets down around the Maritime Museum up there. They have, uh, uh, I've helped set up these huge tanks in the street where these guys bring these RC submarines up there. And of course the wire's sticking out of the water, but the subs are underneath and they run them around. But going on board the Cobia, uh, I've uh, been on there and, as a tour guide and uh, sat in a couple of different compartments, explaining the compartments to people as they come through. After waiting multiple years, Richard was recently accepted into the VFW. He was hesitant to submit his forms since he felt he did not contribute enough to the war. One of the biggest reasons Richard was accepted was having his dolphins. Having dolphins means you went through extensive training on the systems aboard a submarine. Not only was that a factor, but he collected hazardous duty pay and was armed and ready for conflict while patrolling Cyprus and Greece. Thanks to these qualifications, Richard finally became a proud member of the VFW. Richard's documentary was my second documentary of the school year. I got to take over on the project after some unforeseen circumstances happened, but I couldn't be more grateful. His story really hit home at points, whether it be about his mom not wanting him to enlist because Vietnam was cranking up, or even him just trying over and over again to get up the water tower. He really taught me a lot through his story, and I'm really thankful for that. I'm also really thankful that this class has provided the opportunity to tell Richard's and Edward's story this year. I really feel like I had the opportunity to grow as a person through my beliefs and my morals and just think about my actions more because I really learned a lot from these two people who are now part of my life and will be forever. Thank you, Richard, for telling your story and allowing me the opportunity to retell it in a new way so future generations can hear it too.